Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and welcome to our Tuesday night live Bible study. I'm Andrew Womack and I'm really glad that you're with us. I'm going to be sharing some things with you from Romans chapter 8. If you've been with me the last few weeks, I've been studying through Romans and so uh, I've now finished Romans, but I've been meditating on this and we're going to share some things with you that I promise you are awesome. So stay tuned, but first we've got Julianne Harris here with us. She's a blessing and she's going to be sharing with you how you can participate, how you can ask questions. We got a giveaway, meetings coming up, so. We got a whole gamut of things. That is a word, right? Gamut. It is. Okay. <laughs> sometimes I try to use these words and sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. <laughs> so we have a whole gamut of announcements that I want to share with you today. So we do these live Bible studies five days a week. So on Mondays and Fridays, we have live Bible study at 10 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays is at 6 p.m. And then Wednesday. Wednesday morning is at 7 a.m. and that is all mountain time. So we want you to calculate those out, tune in while we're live so that you can interact with us. So we want you to go down to the chat section and as questions enter into your heart, please type those questions in and then about the last 10 now minutes. Now what was that, enter into your heart? Your heart, questions, yeah. Okay, is I missed that. Is that not biblically? Well, no, I, so? anyway, that's fine, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I broke your rhythm. Go back, please. <laughs> go back. Rewind. I'm we sorry. can't rewind. It's live. All right. Go okay. Ahead. Okay. So as the questions enter into your heart, we want you to type those questions in. And then the last 10 to 15 minutes of the program, we're getting a we're going to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. So that is what we do five days a week. Tuesday nights are uber special because we have- Uber special. Uber special. That's what like does that super, mean? like super duper, it's uber. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, your language is just different than mine. That's <laughs> well, so, I think you're weird. Well, I think you're weird. <laughs> anyway, we're having a great time. We uh, are. <laughs> okay, so on Tuesday nights, it's special because we have live Bible study notes. So you want to sign up for those. And what will happen is, is when you sign up, you'll go to awmi.net slash study. You'll put in your information. And then next week, Monday morning, you're going to get tonight's notes. So when you sign up for those notes, you are entered into a drawing for a free product. And that's what we do every Tuesday night with Andrew. And so um, the free product we're giving away tonight is Don't Limit God. So sign up for those notes. Um, Andrew has autographed this book. It's an amazing Amazing book. I listened to this uh, teaching a lot. And then last week, we gave away the new you and the Holy Spirit. And the winner of that was Moses Afolabi. I hope I got that okay. But Moses, they will be getting a hold of you and getting that book to you. Next, we do have events coming up. We have um, In God We Trust, which is an amazing patriotic live performance. It's absolutely phenomenal, you guys. And I would encourage you, bring your family, bring your friends, invite your neighbors. Uh, this is an amazing play. And that is July 3rd and the 4th. And then immediately following that, we have Summer Family Bible Conference. That's July 5th through the 8th. And then I wanted to also announce that we are going to have a open house event the Saturday following uh, Summer Family Bible Conference. So we would love for you to sign up and be a part of that. So please reach out to us. Uh, we also have a Healing is Here conference. So we have two of the biggest conferences in July and August, and Healing is Here is absolutely phenomenal. And um, so I would encourage you to sign up for that. That's August 9th through the 12th. You can go to awmi.net slash events and find out more information and register and let us know that you're coming. Yes, sir. And Richard Roberts is going to be one of our special guests. This oh, that's year. amazing. So he'll be praying for people to be really good. Oh, wow. So for those of you who don't know, Richard Roberts is Oral Roberts' son. Mm -hmm. And so that is absolutely amazing to be coming to Healing is Here. That's, that'll be awesome. So check those events out. A couple more announcements. I just want to make sure that you're aware that we have prayer ministers available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so it doesn't matter what time you're watching this video. If you're going through something, they want to pray with you. Uh, I work in that area and it is phenomenal. And I know Andrew talks about walking through the prayer 
uh, center all the time and you got people standing up, they're declaring the word, they're standing in their authority awesome. and we have testimony after testimony come out. So please don't hesitate if you're going through something, give us a call at 719-635-1111 and also while you're on the phone with them, did you know that you can be a part of these live streams and all the live content coming out of this ministry? by becoming a partner or simply giving. So I would encourage you uh, to sow into fertile ground. This is fertile ground and you can be a part of it. And so you can go to awmi.net slash give or give us a call at 719-635-1111. And I think that's all my announcements other than gospeltruth.tv. That is 24 hours a day, seven days a week of Andrew and Friends. So check that out. Just go to your web browser and type in gospeltruth.tv and uh, check it out. So we're ready. You did really good with did the I? exception of that Uber comment. Well, uh, I thought I did really good with the exception of all the interruptions that kept happening, but you know. <laughs> Uber, I thought, was some kind of a ride no, service. It is, but no, Uber is actually an adjective or is an it in adverb. The dictionary? It is. You sure? Well, it's in the Google dictionary. Under slang or something? Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, I've learned something already. Wow. So I believe you're going to learn some things here from Romans <laughs> chapter 8. If you were with us last week, I was sharing from Romans chapter 6 about how that we don't have an old man anymore. And you know, that's a radical statement because the vast majority of Christians believe that when you get born again, you still have your sinful nature and now you have this new born again nature and so you're schizophrenic. And actually that's the way that it's taught by the vast majority of people. And so from Romans 6, I was saying that's not so. And the only reason that we still have a propensity for sin is because our old nature corrupted the way that we think in a sense. It programmed us to be selfish and to lust and to hate and to do things like this. And so it's not that you're dealing with an old nature once you get born again, you're dealing with an unrenewed mind. And that's the reason that Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, don't be conformed to this world or to the way that the world thinks, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so really the Christian life, when you get born again, your spirit is now complete. <laughs> it's as perfect as it will ever be in eternity. So you don't need to get more faith into your spirit, more anointing, more power or anything. Your spirit is exactly the way it'll be throughout all eternity. And so one third of your salvation is complete and the rest of the Christian life is a renewing of the mind, changing the way you were programmed, the way you think. And if your spirit is perfect and if your mind gets into agreement, then that's two against one and you will just experience healing, prosperity, joy, peace, all of those things in your physical body. So that's what we talked about last week. So the results of all of this is in Romans chapter 8, and in verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And the word for uh, no in this uh, verse is an absolute unqualified negative. That means without any exception to an extreme, there is zilch, zero, not a condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And you know, condemnation is kind of a religious term that sometimes we don't really think about what it means, but it's similar to when a building becomes uninhabitable and it, you know, the electricity's bad or the uh, structure is bad and so they'll condemn the building and say it's unfit for use. And in a layman's term, this is what condemnation is. It just means that you're unfit for use. Yeah. And did you know that most Christians actually feel that way? Most Christians, if you truly are born again, if you have any relationship with God at all, you believe that God is almighty and He can do anything. That's not where the problem comes. The disconnect comes that you believe God can do it, but you doubt that He will do it for you because you feel condemned, unfit for use. But this is saying that there is no, zero, zilch, not a condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, and then it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is such a radical statement that God doesn't hold anything against you and there is no condemnation towards you at all. It is so radical that again, religion 
teaches that when you do well, God loves you. When you do bad, God rejects you. And so they use this last half of this verse to say, well, there's only no condemnation to you when you are walking after the spirit instead of after the flesh. Uh, that's not the point that's being made. There is no condemnation from God towards you as a born again believer, period. Zip, zero, nada. Now there still is condemnation and that's the reason this phrase is here, but the condemnation doesn't come from God. It comes from people and it comes from the devil. For instance, if you were to take what I'm saying here and saying that, well, God just loves me because of what Jesus did and he's not going to condemn me or make me feel unfit for use or reject my prayer because I haven't been holy enough. If you accept that and just think, well, then there's no consequence to my sin. And you go out and you go rob a bank, you go commit murder, you do something like that thinking there's no consequence to my sin, no condemnation to me. Well, there's no condemnation from God. If you were truly born again, God forgave all of your sin, past, present, and even the sin that you haven't committed yet. Amen. Which that's another really, really radical statement that I hadn't got time to verify, but I have an entire teaching on that from Romans. I mean, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, 15, chapter 10, verses 10, 14, and 12, 23. I hadn't got time to go through that, but God forgave all of your sin, past, present, and future. And I believe that. There is no condemnation from God, but there would be condemnation from people. If you go out and steal and rob, I guarantee you, you're going to get the wrath of other people against you. If you get caught, they will prosecute you and you could be in your jail cell just having a wonderful time with God. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to hold your sins against you. And you could just worship and fellowship with God the whole time that you're rotten in your jail cell. Mm -hmm. But see, there still is condemnation. It's just not from God. So it's like there's two planes. It's not only your relationship with God that counts, but you also have a relationship with people down here and also with the devil. Even if God isn't bringing his judgment upon you, sin opens up a door for people to hurt you and reject you. And it also gives Satan an inroad into your life. I used this verse last week, but in Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, then you yield to the author of that sin, the one who tempted you, Satan, and he gets inroad into your life. So it would be totally improper to just say there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. It would be proper if you say there is no condemnation from God to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. That would be proper. But if you leave out and just say that there's no condemnation, there is no consequences to sin, there is no bad results of sin to those in Christ Jesus, that's an incorrect statement because, again, you reap what you sow from people and from the devil. So that's the reason that it says that there is no, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But let me, since I've explained away that second phrase, let me just go back and focus on this, that if you are in Christ Jesus, which 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. When you get born again, you get a new nature so if you are in Christ, this is talking about a person who's been born again and now has received a new nature and is connected to God through the Spirit. And if that has happened to you, if you are born again, there is zilch, zero, not a condemnation from God towards you. Amen. That is nearly too good to be true new. News And most people just think, how can that be? Because again, you think in the natural realm. You know, most people don't really know who they are in the spirit. They only know themselves based on their actions and the way they think in their emotional personality part of them. And we know that our actions aren't per perfect. There are many of us that are displeased with ourselves over our weight, over our looks, over our actions. 
And then when we search our emotions, we get upset, we get fearful, we get angry, uh, all kinds of things. And we are just so dissatisfied with our, what the Bible calls our flesh, the body, our actions, and our emotions, that we think, how can God love us? It's because God is a spirit. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and He is looking at your born-again, recreated spirit. That's how He fellowships with you. And remember that verse, it says you must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It didn't say that's the best way to worship Him. It says you must connect, have a relationship with God based on who you are in the spirit and not based on your actions and your thought and emotions. Now again, am I saying that your actions and thoughts and emotions are unimportant? No, they are important because that's how you relate to people and also if you have bad actions and thoughts, that's how you give Satan and wrote into your life. So it is important that you act correctly, but when it comes to God, He is looking at you in the Spirit and this is the reason that there is absolutely zero rejection, condemnation from God towards you if you are in Christ Jesus. And I tell you, if you could ever understand that, it would cause the love of God to abound in your life to such a degree that you would wind up serving God better accidentally than you ever did on purpose before. When you are serving God trying to earn His favor, but yet you are consciously focused on your actions and wondering, God, is it enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I fasted enough? Have I done enough? When you approach God that way, you're never going to have confidence. You're never going to have boldness because I don't care how good you live, there's always something that you could do better. But when you understand that it's just who you are in the Spirit and you're going to worship God through the Spirit and God is not going to have any condemnation, no rejection of you whatsoever, it will cause love to abound. And there's many scriptures over in Romans chapter 13, I believe around verse 8 or 10, and also in James, there's a number of places that love is the fulfilling of the law. And all of the commandments, you shall not uh, kill, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not do all these things, all of it is briefly comprehended in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you understand love, and if you receive love, I guarantee you, love is the fulfilling of the law, and it will just set you free. And this is where a lot of people are missing it. So anyway, that's a long time I spent on verse 1. And then in verse 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And so this is based on verse 1, where if you're in Christ, your spirit is changed. There is zero condemnation from God towards you. And that law of the spirit of life, this law about what has happened to you in your spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? As it says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. There is a wage to be earned when you sin and it's death. But through Jesus, because you've been born again and you now have a new spirit, you don't reap death anymore from your sin. All of your death, all of the payment for your sin was placed upon Jesus and He suffered it so that you wouldn't have to suffer it. If God was going to punish you for your sin, then He would have been unjust in punishing Jesus and punishing you. That's double jeopardy. He punished Jesus for all of your sins, past, present, and even the ones you haven't committed yet. And once you understand that, <laughs> man, it just sets you free Amen. from this law of sin and death. Another way of explaining this is over in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, say all of the blessings that will come upon you conditional upon you acting correctly. Now, we live under a different covenant, and so we don't relate to God the way that Deuteronomy chapter 28 says, but there's still lessons to be learned. In the Old Testament, you had to perform and keep the law in order to obtain these promises. In the New Covenant, Christ kept the law, and we get it through who Jesus is. But in verses 15 through 68, 
of Deuteronomy chapter 28 lists all of the curses that will come upon you. And Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For as it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And then the next verse says that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through faith. So Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 68 that list all of the curses, you could say it this way, that's the law of if you sin, you get death. Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68 instead of the blessing of Deuteronomy 28, 1 through uh, 14. So here again, you could say it this way, in Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. You could say that because of what Jesus did and that I'm now born again and have a new spirit, then I reap Deuteronomy 28, uh, 1 through 14 instead of all of the curses. I am free from the curses and I get the blessings, not because I've done everything right, but because Jesus did everything right for me and He's given me what His righteousness produced, not what my unrighteousness produces. Then in verse 3 it says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Talking about our flesh. The law was perfect. And if a person could keep the law, then you could literally earn every blessing of God. But the truth is, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody has ever kept the law except one. That's Jesus. Amen. So you can't approach God and try and earn His favor by keeping the law because it was weak through our flesh. The law wasn't, wasn't weak, but we were weak. We could never match up to it. So what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, our flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. In the flesh of who? Jesus. In the flesh of Jesus. Amen. You and I deserve to be condemned, but God put our sin upon Jesus and condemned him. And that's the reason, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation to you because all of God's condemnation, all of God's wrath, all of his rejection for your sin and mine has already been placed upon Jesus. Amen. Man, that is nearly too good to be true. And you know, sad to say, the average Christian doesn't understand this. They think when they get born again that God has forgiven their sins to a degree, and if they die, they're going to go to heaven instead of to hell, but they still are going to be condemned. They still are going to lose their fellowship with God. They can't expect to get a prayer answered unless they've done everything right. That's a wrong conception. And because of that, that's an inroad of Satan into your life because you never do everything right. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lived holier than most of you. I'm not saying that bragging, but I've just been seeking God my whole life. And I remember one time I got up and I fasted all day long and I spent about, I think it was 16 or 17 hours and I read from Mark all the way through the book of Revelation in one day. And I was so pleased with myself thinking, man, God, this was awesome. Now you're bound to owe me something because I had been so holy and fasted and prayed and studied the Word all day. And as soon as I started thinking like that, I had the thought come to me, I believe inspired by the devil, you were up 17 hours. You only spent 16 hours studying the Word. And did you know I actually wound up going to bed feeling condemned, like, oh God, I could have done more. You can never do enough. If you are going to trust in your own goodness, you will never be enough. I promise you, I've tried and I'm better than most of you and it still didn't amount to anything. The wages of sin is death and all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who wants to be the best sinner that ever got denied something? If you're a sinner, you need a Savior. And if you have a Savior, then you get it through who He is, not through who you are. That's what this is saying, that God condemned, put His judgment for your sin into the body of Jesus and judged you through Jesus. And there is no judgment from God against you anymore. Now, again, there's still consequences. You go out and commit adultery, 
you're going to suffer for it and somebody else is going to suffer and there could be shame and there could be rejection and if nothing else, Satan is going to condemn you through it. So I'm not saying that you go live in sin, but from God, there is no condemnation to you in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 4, it says that the right, all of this happens so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So because of what God did, putting your sin and my sin upon Jesus, and He suffered our condemnation, He not only took our guilt and our punishment, but He gave us His righteousness, mm -hmm. not our righteousness, not a self-righteousness, but He gave us a holy and pure righteousness. You are now righteous through Jesus. Amen. And so the righteousness of the law has been fulfilled in you and me. And again, some people look in the mirror and think, you don't know what I did. It doesn't matter what you've done in your body. It doesn't matter what your thoughts are. If you have been born again, if you made Jesus your Lord in your spirit, you are as righteous and holy and pure as Jesus is, because you've been given His righteousness. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, God the Father, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God took our sin and gave us His righteousness. And if anybody says, well, all of my righteousness is like filthy rags, that's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 64, I believe it's verse 6. All of our righteousness is this filthy rags. And so somebody says, what about that? I agree. Your self-righteousness, your righteousness that is based on your actions is like a filthy rag. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says, Jesus is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. If you are calling your born again spirit, the righteousness you have there, if you're calling that a filthy rag, then you're calling Jesus a filthy rag because he was made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. So anyway, we could go on and on and I could spend a lot more time. But if you understand what I've said, this should make you feel like there is no condemnation, an absolute unqualified negative, that there is no judgment, no rejection from God towards you for any of your sin, if you've been born again. Now, if you haven't been born again, you have to receive Jesus as your Lord and receive that righteousness as a gift. And so if you haven't been born again, that doesn't apply. But if you've made Jesus your Lord, there is zero condemnation. All of God's wrath was placed upon Jesus, and you not only had your ungodliness taken away, but you had all of Jesus' righteousness given to you, and you are as righteous and pure as Jesus is. If you could understand that, it would cause you to approach God boldly. And when you need something, instead of thinking, well, God, I know you could do it, but will you do it? You'll lose that doubt because you are standing in His righteousness. God the Father will answer your prayers just as surely as He would answer the prayers of Jesus because you have His righteousness in you. Man, that is the gospel. That is nearly too good to be true news. And I just pray and believe that God will help you to understand what I've said today. If you would ask for my teaching on spirit, soul, and body, it would go into more detail on this. I've also got a lot of teaching entitled Eternal Redemption and just, man, a lot of things that cover these same truths. It will go into more detail. And you could call our helpline. We've got the number on the screen. And uh, they could give you more detail. They could pray with you, maybe answer some questions that you have. Do we have any questions from the viewers? We have an uber amount of an questions. An uber amount. <laughs> I guess that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> Either that or it's a whole car. <laughs> no, we got great questions, so please continue to keep uh, submitting them. This is a powerful, most amazing message, and it will radically change your life. So I'll uh, mention the teachings again at the end. So we have Sharon on YouTube who says, how do we get our soul, our mind, to agree with our spirits completely? It is not easy, 
exclamation point, Jesus. Well, it isn't easy, but the reason it isn't easy is because you've spent, I don't know how old you are, Sharon, but if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever, you've spent that many years listening to a lie yes. and just looking and thinking that all you are is a physical body and then your mental, emotional part. And that's a lie because there's another part of you. And when you get born again, that born again part of you is exactly like I've been describing tonight. And the only way you can change your thinking is to take the Bible. It says in James chapter one, it's like a spiritual mirror. And if you want to see if your physical face in the mirror, if you want to see if your hair's combed, you have to go look at a mirror. You can't go by what you think your face looks like. You look in a mirror, you see a reflection. Well, it's the same thing. This is a reflection of who you are in Christ. Amen. And so you hold up the Word of God and you take these scriptures and you begin to start meditating. And, and the, you know, it's not easy to counter 50 years worth of wrong thinking, but I can guarantee you this is so powerful that give it a month or two months or six months or come to Bible school for two years and I guarantee you, you'll come out of there stronger than horseradish Amen. because you will see who you really are in Christ. It's a process. But um, it can be done. I've done it. I'm still doing it. It's not complete, but I tell you, I have an awareness of who I am in Christ. Amen. You can do it. Amen. Praise God. Um, so Jackie on chat says, Andrew, you say our spirit will be the same all throughout eternity. Is everyone's spirit the same? Absolutely. When you get born again, it says that he, uh, Galatians chapter four, verse six, that he sends into your heart the spirit of his son Amen. crying, Abba, Father. And then according to Romans chapter eight, verse nine, it says, the last part of that verse says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So when you get born again, it's not that here's God's spirit and then here's your born again spirit. Your born again spirit is God breathed. It came from God and it is identical to Jesus. First John chapter four, verse 17 says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Amen. Put that together with 1 Corinthians six seventeen that says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit and that Greek word for one is hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. We aren't one in the sense that here's God and here we are parallel to him, but on a lesser plane. We are identical to Jesus in your spirit because it's the spirit of his son that came into it. When you got born again, you are born of God. Your spirit is as pure as Jesus is right now. Not just when you get to heaven, but right now it's again back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, so are we in this world. Right now, your spirit is as pure and holy as Jesus is, and so therefore, my born-again spirit, Julianne's born-again spirit, your born-again spirit are identical. It is Christ living in us, and every one of us is identical, and it's gonna be the same throughout eternity. When we get to heaven, it's not your spirit that gets changed. It's your soul that will all of a sudden know all things, even as also it's known, and your physical body will change. You'll get a glorified body. But one third of your salvation is over, complete. In the spirit, you are as pure, holy, righteous, powerful, knowing as Jesus is. And the rest is convincing your mind and then acting accordingly. So for all eternity, our soul, we'll still have our soul connected with our spirit. So even though our spirits are the same, we'll still have our same personality, right? Well, is my understanding. we will have an individual personality. Yeah. But some of our personalities. Well, no, we'll be <laughs> same. Some of our personalities need to be changed. <laughs> so I believe that there's going to be a huge change. Once we see yeah. and have a total understanding of what God did for us, I guarantee you pride, yeah, arrogance, uh, boasting about what you've done, all that stuff's gonna be totally gone. We're gonna live in humility and union with God. But I believe that there will be personalities yeah. in heaven. But, but it's they who will, God created you. They'll be glorified personalities, right. not this same personality that we have here. Right, well, praise God. I hope I still like you in heaven. I bet you you'll love me even more. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so my on YouTube says, what's the difference between regret and condemnation? Is it by nature to have a sense of regret whenever one does something bad or yields to temptation? You know, that's a really good question. A friend of mine, Greg Fritz, who's on our Gospel Truth TV, and he's taught here on this Bible study, he has a teaching entitled No Regret. And he was actually teaching that on a Tuesday night Bible study. And I was telling him, I said, I don't have any condemnation about things I've done, but I do regret things that I've done. Yeah. And he was trying to tell me, you shouldn't even regret it. And I'm not sure on this one, but personally, there are things I've done that I regret. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I define regret as just a sense of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but a sense of sadness about what I've done, a sense of, it's not shame. I think shame is wrong. I think that condemnation is wrong, but I, I am not proud of a lot of the things that I've done. And uh, it, it's sad when I think about how I've hurt other people or how I've not done things that I should. So anyway, I know that there may be people who differ on this and maybe I don't fully understand what is meant by regret. We could, have, we could attach different definitions to that. But the way I look at it, I do regret times that I'm not the person I'm supposed to be, but I'm not condemned about it. I know right. that God loves me. You know, I had uh, somebody, I forgot, I, I forget who this was, but it was somebody that was talking about a little, you know, two-year-old that draws something and they're all outside of the lines and it's, they painted, you know, I, I mean, it just, it looks terrible, but they go and show it to their parent and the dad says, oh, that's beautiful. Now, was it really beautiful or was it just you giving a compliment that they're moving in the right direction? Right. From the dad's standpoint, it was beautiful to him, but it wasn't beautiful what was done. Right. Likewise, we all mess up. Mm -hmm. But I believe that God looks at us and recognizes our frame. He remembers that we're dust. That's a quotation from Scripture. And because of that, even when we mess up, God still loves us. He sees that we're on a path to improving mm -hmm. And he, he's still proud of us. He still loves us. And so I believe that God doesn't look at us the way we look at ourselves. He sees us the end from the beginning. He sees where we are in this growth process. And it's like a little kid that falls off a bike and they didn't do it right, but they tried. And he says, you did good. Yeah, that's well, good. you didn't do good. You fell. Right. But you, you were moving in the right direction. And so he encourages you along the way. Yeah. So it's that kind of a thing. He still encourages. He, he never condemns us. There's no condemnation from God, but we do mess up. Yeah. Yeah. That's Some very good. Some more than others. Amen. <laughs> hey, uh, Yvette on Facebook. You know, along those lines, what I was thinking is, you know, like, I, I, I don't want to live in regret because I don't want to live there. Right? So I think there's a moment uh, where you can look back, you can think back and be like, ah, I missed that. I missed it right there. Yes. But this one thing that I do, forgetting yeah, that which is behind. Philippians 3.13, right? Paul said, yeah. forgetting those things which yeah. are behind. Does that mean that he forgot God touching his life and calling him to the ministry no. and the thing? No, I think you have to understand it, that he was forgetting all of the negative, negative. things, yeah. all of the people that he had been That's responsible for arresting and right. killing. He had put those things under the blood. And, yeah. But I guarantee you, he wasn't proud of what no. he did. Matter of fact, he even said in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I am the least of all the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle because of the things I did. So he still remembered those things, but he wasn't remembering them in a way that caused shame and condemnation. Right. So there's a balance yeah. to these things. We, we need to get the heart of what's being said. Amen. That's good. So Yvette on, YouTube, on Facebook says, how do you worship in spirit and in truth? Do you sing worship or like serve in the gifts of the spirit? Like how do you uh, worship in spirit and in truth? Well, it's all of the above, but specifically what it's talking about, when you worship God in spirit, you are coming before him based on who you are in the spirit, Amen. not based on who you are in the flesh. So if a person approaches God and said, oh God, I'm such a failure. God, I never do anything right. Oh God, I'm so sorry. 
and you approach God like that, you aren't in the spirit. You are in the flesh because your flesh is the only part of you that messes up and fails. In the spirit, you are as righteous and pure as Jesus is. So the way to approach God is to say, God, I messed up again, but man, I am born again. And in the spirit, I've been forgiven and cleansed of all sin. Now that's worshiping God in spirit. Now you can do that through singing. You can do that through uh, you know, uh, talking and stuff, but those are, those are kind of secondary issues. Worshiping God in spirit is talking about approaching him on the basis of who you are in Christ and not based on your own thoughts and your own actions. That's awesome. Uh, Tiffany on YouTube says, while we are renewing our mind to the truth of God's goodness, how do we get through the right now? Well, if you'd take what I've talked about tonight, yeah. and even though right now you may, let's, let's just take an example that you're still smoking and you feel terrible about it, but you just can't seem to break it. How do you deal with it? You just start rejoicing in the fact that God, even though I can't seem to get rid of this, I am still righteous. Yeah. You still love me. As a matter of fact, Keith Moore, who's a friend of mine, he told a story about a guy that came to his church in Branson, Missouri, and he was, he'd been delivered from drugs and alcohol, but he couldn't seem to break free of smoking. And so he was just condemned. And what Keith told him to do, he says, every time you light up that cigarette, say, I am the righteousness of God. And the guy immediately says, but I'm not righteous when I'm smoking. And he said, yes, you are in your spirit. You're still righteous. Your actions don't match who you are in the spirit. But you just remind yourself every time you smoke that you are the righteousness of God. And I forget the exact length of time. It was weeks or month or something like that, that every time this guy lit up a cigarette, he just would say, I am still the righteousness of God. And he just focused on the fact of who he was in spirit. And his testimony was that after weeks or a month or whatever period of time, he started to light up a cigarette and he said, I am the righteousness of God. And all of a sudden he thought, I am the righteousness of God. Why am I doing this? And he just threw away his cigarettes and never had another problem. And most people are trying to shovel the dark out of their life. But what you need to do is turn on a light and the light will drive out the darkness. So if you focus on who you are in Christ, it will literally break the dominion of sin over you. Whereas if you focus on all of your failures, it just seems to magnify those problems. And that condemnation is the opposite of love and faith. And so it'll drive you away from God. So you just focus on who you are in Christ and it'll change you. Man, that's powerful. So Jess on YouTube says, does righteousness only come through faith? Um, if so, does that mean that keeping the law could never bring righteousness? That's exactly right. Yes. Man, you it's got awesome. it. I know. <laughs> That's awesome. It, it only comes through faith. You cannot yeah. be righteous through your own actions. That's what the Bible calls self-righteousness. And that's what Isaiah 64, 6 is talking about when it says all of your righteousness is like a filthy rag. That's talking about self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. And it is just, no, that was 64.6, not 64.8. And if you look that word up, did you know what the word uh, righteousness is like a filthy rag? That Hebrew word literally is uh, menstrual cloth is what it's talking about. It's saying that your self-righteousness is like a menstrual cloth that's good for nothing except throwing it away. You certainly don't wear it and brag about it. Yeah. And so your self-righteousness is no good. The only way you can have righteousness with God is through faith. That's a great truth. I think they're getting it. I think he's gotten it. Absolutely. Did you want to do one more question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we one more it. question. So we got, yeah, because we got plenty of them. So Shane on YouTube says, if we don't earn anything, what's it mean God is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him? Well, God does reward us, but it's not earning it. Uh, God relates to us by grace, not based on what you do, but he's not ignorant of what you do. And when you do the right thing, when you turn the other cheek, when you go out and lead a person to the Lord, there are rewards. Rewards are different than getting justice. None of the rewards come because you really deserve it. You know, I had somebody today tell me, you really deserve this. 
And I told him, I said, I don't think I deserve it, but it is a blessing of God because I've been seeking him. And he said, if you seek, you find. And I said, it's a blessing and I'll receive it. But it, the rewards aren't really earned. They're just God giving these things. It's like if I have employees and I reward somebody, does that mean that they have done everything perfect and that they are perfectly holy and stuff? No, in a sense, any reward that I give an employee is still a grace gift because nobody does everything perfectly. But I do recognize that they're trying and that they're performing and I will go ahead and reward people. I just got a note today of one of my employees thanking me for a raise that I gave them and, and stuff. And in a sense, you could say they deserved it, but in another sense, we gave them this raise. You can't sit there and demand it and stuff. So that's the way I look at rewards. They are grace rewards. They aren't really things that you earn. Well, thank you. I still have a job after this live Bible study. Yes, you are very welcome. That's a grace <laughs> gift. Grace gift. It's a reward. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so anyway, we're out of time tonight, but thank you for joining us and, Amen. and being with us. And uh, I believe that these truths, I know that this was really quick, what I said, but you could go into a lot further detail. And that's the reason that we have people at our phones 24 seven. You could call and you could just say, man, does Andrew have any more teaching on this? And they've got lists of teaching. I probably, I don't even know. I probably have 20 or 30 of my series yeah. deal in one way or another with what I was talking about tonight right. and it would help you. And so if this is radical to you, if you didn't understand it. That doesn't mean it's wrong. Don't reject it. Study it out. And I tell you, if you ever understand that God loves you because he is love and not because you are lovely, Amen. that will just change your life. Amen. It'll be a blessing. Amen. So, so thanks, Julianne, for being with me tonight. Well, You're thanks. always a blessing. <laughs> well, thanks, Andrew. You are too. And you guys make sure and tune in tomorrow morning, bright and early at 7 a.m. We'll have live Bible study, and that's Mountain Time. And uh, as for the book, Spirit, Soul, and Body, and Andrew also mentioned eternal redemption. Yeah. Um, the war is over, I felt like. Um, yeah, the war is over. The war is over. I've got powerful. a lot of stuff. Over. Yeah, it, it's kind of threaded all throughout your teaching, but yeah. yeah. Uh, the true nature of God, yes. living in the balance of grace and faith yeah. is really good on this. Um, the Word became flesh. Like I said, I've got a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, yeah. So anyway, God it bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you. Again. Well, I won't see you next week because I'll be gone, but we're going to have Greg Moore, I believe. Yeah, Greg Moore. Yep. And so, God bless you. We'll see you again. Bye. Even in our darkest moments, a light imperishable still burns. A beacon of freedom and liberty and peace. What do we say, Williams? Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV. 